Hey, let's start now. Hello, everybody. Welcome on behalf of the International Association for Adolescent Health. My name is Risa Turetsky, and I am the chair of the IAH Education Committee. This is the final session of four in our symposium series. Throughout this symposium, we have aimed to stimulate international discussion about how to best educate and train professionals to deliver effective healthcare for young people in the world. We have invited four people today to share their ideas and experiences. They'll each present for 15 minutes, followed by five minutes for your questions. Please type your question in the Q&A box. We'll get through as many as possible today. If there's insufficient time, we'll just ask the presenters to respond after the session and we'll circulate the answers. A link to the program for the session will be in the chat. It contains a summary of each presentation and more details about the presenters. All of these sessions are being recorded and will be available on the IAH YouTube channel after the session. To start us off, I would like to invite Professor John Klein, President of the International Association for Adolescent Health, to say a few words. Thank you, Risa, and uh, good afternoon or good evening or good morning, depending on where you might be. I'm actually coming to you today from a meeting at the World Health Organization as part of uh, an advisory group to the uh, Maternal Child Adolescent Health and Nutrition uh, Departments at WHO. And it is uh, my pleasure to uh, welcome you to the webinar. I wanna thank the speakers and also thank the participants. Uh, IAAH has launched this series of webinars and will be doing several others over the coming year as part of our commitment and our follow-up to the Global Forum for Adolescents that took place in October. Um, we've made a commitment along with the other healthcare professional associations in the partnership for um, women's, children's, and adolescents' health to working as content experts within our countries to help encourage new commitments for adolescent health and well-being. Um, if you are following any of the global forum, you know that about 18 countries have already made commitments along with a bunch of uh, membership organizations funders, and other civil society groups. And we hope that uh, many of you will engage in that in, in your country as the uh, pediatric and OBGYN and nursing organizations uh, try to create the advocacy that's needed to improve adolescent services. The Education Committee has been hard at work looking at how do we really address competencies? How do we make sure that the care that's delivered to adolescents is the best quality care possible, and how do we make that part of a sustainable system of education? And I'm not going to take much more of your time, uh, but we'll let you get to the speakers and the discussion uh, to follow. I would invite you to become involved in some of the IAAH's work over the coming year, and especially invite you to join us at the next uh, Global Congress, which will be in Jamaica in November of 2025. And um, we will be having interpretation, at least Spanish and English, hopefully other languages as well. And we hope that we'll see many of you uh, both in the lead up to that and uh, at that time. So thanks again. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna need to go back into the meeting and I can't stay for the webinar, but um, I'm, I'm glad you're all here and I look forward to being able to listen to the tape. Thank you so much, Dr. John Klein. <clears throat> Um, now I would like to present our presentation for today. We are going to start off with Dr. Dr. Chakraborty. She is a consultant pediatrician and a developmental pediatrician in Kolkata, India. She has many incredible roles, including founder of an NGO that works throughout India. Dr. Dr. Chakraborty, please go ahead. Yes. Thank you. So I'm I'm sharing my screen. Start my video. Good afternoon, everybody, and 
Namaste from India to all dignitaries in the chairs and special thanks to IIH, IIH for giving me this opportunity to talk in this forum. So I am Dr. Shramani Chakuti from India. I'll talk about better adolescent nurture for a brighter global future, a journey by NGO. So we want a smart global citizens, certainly mentally and physically healthy, certainly not fighting with each other and destroying our planet, obviously not terrorizing others, not a world governed by only robots. We want a globe safe for us. We want human beings helping each other for eco-friendly sustainable development by sharing our knowledge regarding technology, medication, literature, arts, fund, funds to fight against poverty, malnutrition, diseases, calamities, and to spread brotherhood. We will win space and trek to other galaxies in future to know and conquer the universe, a world where mind is without fear and head is held high by Gurudev Arendt Tagore, a Nobel laureate. So, Challenges uh, uh, today's teen face, we all know, academic performance, career, specifically after post-pandemic period, family problem, disharmony, financial issues, gender, sexual, sexuality issues, financial, uh, you know, physical causes, body image issues, relationship issues, handling technology and media, blah, blah, blah. So, but underprivileged section of the uh, society, the teens face more grave problem. They have financial issues more. There are school dropouts, specifically after post pandemic period and family practically force them to move distant places for search of job. And they are unskilled. They don't have, you know, opportunity to get training, proper training and job places, obviously unsafe, not hygienic. So they are victim of domestic violence, sexual abuse, substance abuse, cyberbullying, che cheating, and they may develop STI, HIV, and we all know they are being utilized by different illegal uh, illegal activities by negative forces. You know, all all over globe, we faced several times that these young adults and the adolescent are how they are utilized for destroying mankind and our uh, property and all you know uh, the world heritage. So uh, they are also the soft target of human trafficking. Uh, early marriage, unsafe pregnancy. They they don't have proper guidance to fight against the situation and develop positive uh, skill and training. And problem of the teens with special need more serious. Their families are exhausted by this time mentally, physically, and financially. We have to reach to these teens also with special need. Identify and assess and intervene by multidisciplinary team, giving medication, assistive devices, some vocational training to help them towards an uh, independent future. So our mission and vision uh, to, to make this world, this planet, livable for our future gen. We have to reach to everything by a SAI approach, that is suspect, assess, identify, and intervene. Those who need our help and support, we have to reach to all teens and teens with special needs also. Assess them by a trained group of task force dedicated to teen healthcare and intervene in every step to prevent further complication and also guide train them, make them resilient, make them confident for a better future. We may recruit the willing community health activists for the teens, community counselors, grandparent guides, and peer volunteers from different sections of the society and different age groups and train them to work for the teens. Government are doing their job, but this, it is a huge, huge task. We need to come forward and join hands together to make a bigger network, take taking all willing persons in loop and to help to reach every corner of the society in this world. We can join hands to work with NGO and other organizations. We may take help from government employed health workers also that as Asha in our uh, country. We can take help the senior citizens who are experienced enough in this field and have will and energy uh, to serve the society, but they are presently lonely. So, Target tends to reach mental health 
issues and neurodevelopmental disorder like stress, anxiety, depression, internet addiction, substance use, and uh, sexual abuse, domestic violence victims uh, with uh, the teen with conduct disorder, antisocial behavior, learning issues specifically in this post-COVID period, suicidal ideation, teen with ADHD, ODD, autism, ID, specific learning disorder, and physical health issues like menstrual issues, onset pregnancy, malnutrition, obesity, diabetes, and sex sexually transmitted mutated disease and with a, and hiv so uh, so government health worker we will get a map and guideline of an area where we want to reach and also bridging uh, with government community health activists for the team recruited by our uh, NGO locally, class 10 and 12 standards. Peer volunteers uh, will be the teen and young adult from different section like higher schools, colleges, including nursing students, medical students, psychology students, community counselor, like teacher, coach, private tutor, nurses, drawing art, music, dance teachers, etc. And grandparent guides, obviously, retired person, senior citizen, preferred, preferably teachers, nurses, and psychologists want to serve the society. And experts, all doctors and experts from different fields like developmental pediatrician, adolescent health care specialist, psychiatrist, gynecologist, endocrinologist, all therapists and psychologists, special educators, broken, vocational trainer who are will be willing to serve the team. So our tire system first level will be made by the peer volunteers, community health activists for the teens. Identify the, uh, the teens from grassroots level and pick them up who need our support. The trained healthcare worker can visit, identify, and select them. Second level by community counselor and grandparent guides. And third level by the experts. As I have already discussed, the doctors and all experts like adolescent healthcare specialists and developmental pediatricians, special educators, et cetera. So our initiation and starting our resource team uh, will be uh, our first, first job to train uh, the expert person Obviously, they are skilled and knowledgeable person. So one day workshop will be enough for TOT, training of the trainers, to orient the expert in this field, uh, what job we want to do. And the, the experts will then train the community counselors. Community counselors will then train community healthcare activists, grandparent guides, and, and peer volunteers, lastly, and supervised by one expert. During online training program, all uh, one expert should be present. So our management, first plan and then add up few villages and one urban area nearby. PPP, that is public-private partnership for generating fund and donation can be taken from the society. And NGO, other organizations should be clubbed together to work, uh, work together. And communication uh, to be done with schools, club, art, music, dance school, tutorial centers, local health services, administrative bodies. And we can recruit activists um, from social media groups, school, clubs, senior citizen forum, ladies club, etc. So basic training will be uh, by digital forum and in person. Theory uh, by study material served earlier an online training program for six weeks, preferably in weekend, two days in a week, by some lectures, video, role play, and in-person two days workshop by lectures, practical sessions, role play, group discussion, case discussion, and obviously evaluation, some communication material and checklist to be provided after the training. And the peer volunteer, we should select by continuous awareness in society, in school, tutorial classes, extracurricular groups like drawing, dance classes, and cricket, football clubs, scout, NCC. Identify the willing person who want to join. We'll give the number in, in our digital platform. And who want to join, they come to us. And we can train them uh, by online training program, uh, more prolonged. Uh, this time, eight weeks program, two days uh, in a week, uh, preferably weekend, and two days workshop in person, lectures uh, about warning signs, practical uh, training, group discussion, evaluation, and some communication material checklist after the training to be provided. And uh, training include, again, that SAI approach, that is suspect, assess, identify, and intervene. So basic adolescent mental and physical changes to be known to all these uh, service providers. So, how uh, the hormonal changes 
uh, what hormonal changes takes place and bodily changes and their uh, their cognitive development you know we know the adolescent uh, brain work in progress so their uh, prefrontal cortex still um, still developing so they cannot take uh, no judgment properly so they have risk taking behavior they have impulsivity within them so that should be known by these caregivers and prob all problems they face in this society that bullying and all types of uh, all types of problem uh, i have discussed earlier why we should take care of them because they are future gen they will come in the society to serve for the society and all red flag signs knowledge about nutrition to identify malnutrition obesity some menstrual hygiene sti h HIV and uh, regarding their home eating education environment the uh, sexuality actually helps in in very simplified manner in and translated in local language and some intervene in every every time that is healthy lifestyle uh, training can be given from ground grass level and uh, arrangement uh, of some physical activity sports yoga training guidance about balanced diet immunization guidance adequate sleep guidance regarding safety encouraging in creative activity like drawing dance music literature mindfulness meditation and positive uh, what positive effects of these thing on mind and body and communication with parents and teachers and employed if possible how to handle them and uh, their mental physical uh, health and safety to be taken care and uh, some man adaptive coping skill to be identified by this task force that is social withdrawal denial misdirected anger social media overuse uh, specifically substance abuse cell phone violence some warning signs like feeling very anxious nervous frequently feeling tired some psychosomatic uh, signs like headache stomach ache and, and neglecting responsibilities mood uh, moodiness and loss of appetite and uh, have negative uh, having negative thought and total withdrawal from family that should be known and uh, against that sai approach catch them early follow them closely how suspect and catch them by peer volunteers with the help of community health activists for the teens and enroll the names and communicate with your uh, higher group that is community counselor and grand parent guides primary assessment to be done by community activists and co uh, community counselors and guide them by community counselors and grand parent guide nurses dietitian including them and further evaluation health check up and the special guidance training to be given by the experts and with support from parents teachers and other associate and actually from whole society follow them weekly by peer volunteer male female two weekly by community activists and monthly by community counselors and two monthly by uh, experts like doctors and therapists and whole team should have a close communication with each other and gov government employed health workers Doctor, so we have one minute, and one minute and 40 seconds left. So uh, digital platform or awareness program regularly, social media, YouTube and field work, visit to the uh, school, visit to the home and coaching center, local club. So uh, some tips to the teens, balance your skin time, awareness and maintain healthy lifestyle and uh, spend time outdoor, establish healthy eating pattern like that. So social skill training and coping skill to be given by them and two monthly by the, uh, by the experts, that is resource person already discuss an intervention by specific management and assessment so uh, the service place should be clean brighter and colorful and all these thing equipments to be there and some drugs so then uh, awareness to be built about reproductive health and menstrual hygiene and parent and teacher training to be done some some tips to be given to the parents and also to the to the teachers and there will be a annual program during uh, adolescent week celebration two days workshop assessment of progress workshop for the parents workshop for the teachers and connecting with nature cultural programs sports yoga meditation sharing the knowledge healthy lifestyle and cpr training annual meeting and planning for next uh, next year and we can work together to provide them proper guidance better training and support and comprehensive care for a brighter global future i want to reach to underprivileged adolescent and teen with special need 
through a trained and dedicated community health task force for the teens. These mentally and physically healthy resilient teen once become citizen work for benefit of the society will take care of others and will not be harmful to self and the society. This task force has a crucial role to play for proper management training and make pressure life, precious life more productive and healthy. And our journey towards brighter future will be successful. Thank you. I think I'll, I'm in time. Thank you so much. This was amazing. I think this presentation really highlights the importance of training a much broader workforce for healthcare for vulnerable and deprived populations of young people. I love how you brought in the task force idea to maintain accountability. We have a few questions in the chat. I hope that you'll be able to answer um, a couple. Again, we will um, ensure that the answers to other questions are received. Um, how can we identify problems in children if they don't disclose those problems to their parents? So uh, if they don't disclose to parents, we can reach to them. You know, we with the uh, healthcare provider and we can train a specific ta task force and they can talk to the team, you know, the friends or can talk to that in, in they cannot uh, often that this happens they are not talking to you know their parents but they can talk to us the healthcare provider and also their friend and uh, some you know uh, we we should have some skill the non judgmental way and uh, to uh, give them time and uh, some some question to be asked in different way, not, not like parents, you don't do it, you should not do it, it's not in that way. So in more friendly manner and grandparent guides are, you know, grandparents are something different. They can reach to this team very, you know, easier way. That will be our job using these grandparents and they will be more comfortable with this teen friend, uh, the, their peers and grandparents, you know, to share their that's, problems. I think that's great. I love that concept of the grandparents being involved. Um, I also saw in the chat that there's a question. Um, can you clarify which first line health providers you think would be the most likely to provide this health care for young people in these deprived areas? As a first care, first tire will be built by the peer volunteer and the uh, activists, the uh, healthcare activists from rural area. That area we have just adopted that area, so they will be trained and they will pick up. Uh, we uh, we will give some you know pay, uh, uh, some checklist. By that checklist, they will meet uh, in will every weekend and talk to them about their environment, their home and all these things. And they take some information from them. If they find that they have stress, they have anxiety, they have depression, then uh, they can just fast work, simple work with uh, giving them some tips that uh, engage activity, engage in outdoor activities. You can balance your skin time. You can talk to others. You can just, uh, you know, uh, you seek some help from other group so uh, this other way and engage in activities they like and with that that sports music and drawing you know from that you can know their mind you can read their mind and you can help you accordingly first tire can give some coping skill and some you know social skill, how to communicate and the coping with negativity, you know, yeah. just little bit coping with negativity. Uh, so neg uh, they are facing some negative things from environment and cope with that, talk about that and uh, just build your self-esteem, just neglect something, one thing you can handle, something you cannot handle, ignore that. And some okay, positive so self-talk no. This has been fantastic. Thank you for bringing us this wonderful program. And thank you so much for your presentation today. We really appreciate thank it. You, I'd like to now introduce Dr. Brill Goldberg. She'll be our second speaker. 
Dr. Bill Goldberg is a pediatrician and adolescent medicine specialist. She's chief of the adolescent medicine department at the Children's Hospital at St. Peter's University Hospital. Dr. Bill Goldberg, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Okay, I guess I'm going to share my screen. Hang on. Okay, thank you. Thank you again for inviting me and special hi to Jonathan Klein. I remember you from a lot of uh, Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine meetings back in the 90s. So it's nice to see your face again. Um, so my talk has a very different focus from the first talk. And um, I decided to share some of my own personal experiences regarding training um, ped pediatric residents. Um, that is basically my job. I am a pediatrician and I've been taking care of teenagers and young adults since the early 90s. I became board certified in, in a sub board of adolescent medicine in 1997. That's part of the American uh, Board of Pediatrics. And I've worked in four different residency programs throughout my career. I've been a supervisor in urgent care clinics. I've been a, um, a supervisor in you know well clinics. I've taken care of babies and on up. And now really for the last about nine or 10 years, I really only see teenagers and young adults. And I've created an adolescent medicine division. I'm a division of one. So I train residents in two uh, separate res pediatric residency programs. And that includes all the didactic instruction as well as clinical teaching. So one of the things what I, what I thought about trying to figure out um, what it is that I really do on a day-to-day -day basis is I'm, I'm teaching adults, you know, residents are generally young adults. They range from 25 to 35 on average is the age of the people that I'm training. And it's a really different process from teaching elementary or high school students. And, and really it is um, a lot of trying to get people motivated and excited about it. I have residents coming in, they're like born to be a neonatologist. They're never going to really do adolescent medicine, except whatever they're dealing with parents of their little neonatal babies. But I still want them to get the basics out of the field. And what I found is that adults really learn best when they're motivated, when they want to learn something, when they want to get that information. And by creating experiences, not necessarily just didactic, but also personal experiences, and actually getting them um, into different environments has been very effective uh, in terms of training them and giving them um, a broad range of, of uh, care of adolescents. We know that adults need accountability and they also need time to reflection. And I try to create both. I mean, my, my rotation is known as a fairly easy rotation compared to their picky rotation, um, which is probably part of why they love it, but I think it's also um, something that gives them some time to think. So I looked into adult learning theory a little bit, and it's actually called andragogy, which is the science of adult learning. Um, one person who looked uh, at this was Malcolm Knowles, and the theory is concerned with how to teach adults and how they learn. And it's really based on self-directed learning, independent learning, and the characteristics include something like self-concept. They thrive in an independent environment where they're really in the driver's seat with regards to their own learning. They need to get experiences. They may not just be passive, but actually be an active member of a team. And they need to understand what the objectives are, how they're um, going to be oriented, what they really should be looking for. And they're motivated by what's inside them, not necessarily because they're going to get a good grade or a bad grade, because most of my residents are not as concerned about that. They're more concerned about, you know, what, whether they're going to do their best. So I like to think about what I do and what I, the way I train residents as active versus passive learning. So if any of us is involved in training, we know that, and even in our own training, if we just watch somebody do something, we're going to get something out of that, but we're going to get a lot less out of that than if we're really doing it ourselves. And so I often say, think of the difference between a resident going in and seeing a patient versus watching me or another senior doctor perform a history and physical. Um, I've been in that situation. I've had residents observe me. I've had students observe me. And unfortunately, many of them 
end up on their phones. I know it's unbelievable, but a lot of times I'll, if I'm doing a history and a resident is watching me, which sometimes happens in a complex patient, they're literally on their phone. And it I, A, it's rude and B, it um, shows just a, a, that a lack of attention, that they're not able to really focus on what they're doing if their phone is distracting them. So this is our generation, unfortunately, but I always call residents out about it because I, I think it's really a very bad um, precedent for a resident to be on their phone while they're in a room with a patient. So I've tried to get that experiential learning. Rather than just doing lectures, I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one discussion, particularly about cases and case-based learning, which can generate new ideas and allow for more hands-on learning. So I use reflective learning as well not only in the room, but before and after. Here's what I want you to focus on with this patient. And afterwards, what did you think of that interview? What, how did you think that went? Um, I'll give you an example. I had a patient last week that I was interviewing and she came in for kind of an urgent visit because she had, she really wanted STD screening. And she kept kind of alluding to a problem that she had in the summer. And I wasn't really sure what was going on. This is a, a very functional, very wonderful kid who's in a um, combination uh, farm D program, college farm D program at a local university by me. And ultimately, when I really talked to her, what had happened was she had met up with someone on a dating app who kind of seduced her into leaving home and going halfway across the country and living with him while being both emotionally and physically abusive to her. And this was a kid I never would have thought would have fallen for something like this, but she did. And it was a, it was a very traumatic interview, actually. And then afterwards, you know, I spoke to the resident and how did you feel about that? How did you feel about how that information came out? And when they reflect, particularly on fairly dramatic events that sometimes get uncovered in the exam room, um, it really gives them an, an opportunity to get involved and to picture like what would they have done had they gotten that information? So here's how I've structured the rotation. Um, I provide in a four, I have a four week block where I work with my residents and I provide a whole range of experiences to develop their skills. I can't do everything in four weeks. And unfortunately my residents often are post call sometimes and they don't get a full 20 days with me, which I, I wish they would, but at, let's say 15 to 18 days that they're with me out of four weeks. The first thing I do for everybody is I do a one hour hopefully in-person orientation for all the new residents. I give them a schedule. I give them clear expectations. Here's what I want you to read. Here's some practice questions I want you to practice for our board exams. Here's where you're going to be on which and such and such a day. And I give them a detailed schedule so they know exactly where they're supposed to be. There's no nothing fuzzy about what happens when they come in. And when they're with me in my office, I give them ownership of the patient. I let them, I may introduce the, them to the patient, but then I say, go ahead in and get that history. And I'll give them some guidelines. I'll say, this kid is coming in for follow-up of dysmenorrhea and here's what I want you to focus on. But mostly I really send them in and they come out with sometimes some really excellent information that I may not have gotten. I've had residents uncover history that I didn't even know about patients I've been seeing for a while. So this has been... Um, really a help in my practice. In addition to working with me, I also send residents to a partial psychiatric hospitalization program that's actually part of our hospital system. Um, it is a day program, five days a week, which is run by a child and adolescent psychiatrist, mostly for kids with severe uh, ADHD, conduct disorders, depression, um, not eating disorders, but other uh, mental health issues. And as our previous lecture stated, there's certainly a lot of mental health concerns um, in the United States and elsewhere. Um, I also send my residents to an inpatient eating disorder program because I don't see that many patients with eating disorders and I want them to understand the breadth of eating disorders. And I will have them rotate in our sleep disorder clinic as well to learn a little bit about sleep medicine. And here's what I focus on. Um, I do a lot of mini lectures. My practice is centered on adolescent gynecology and psychiatry. So that's a lot of my case-based learning. I give them that first contact. I will model interview skills also. So even if they do see the patient, I will go back in and see the patient with them. And I may uncover certain things that they missed so they can understand what my interview process is about. And they sent, they spend that time at the partial hospitalization program. They do their board preparation. I give them about a hundred uh, prep style questions. 
And then I also give my residents a project. I like to say, think about a topic that either you've known about before, or we've uncovered during the first week or two of the rotation and take a deeper dive and do a PowerPoint presentation for me or a written summary of the topic. And although you know residents don't like to have extra work, I don't make it too difficult. It's something that can take maybe a couple of hours of their time in order to really get a deeper dive into a topic. And this has actually generated case reports, book chapters, research projects. Um, and it's been a really an excellent way for me to um, learn about topics that I may not know that much about, as well as you know, residents to get something else um, that they can discuss if they're lecturing. And my residents seem to be most happy with the fact that there's one-on-one -on -one time with me. I spend a lot of time with them. We talk to them. They get a slice of my life, whatever's going on in my life that month. And I learn a lot about them as people as well. The didactic training, I mostly focus on physical development, psychosocial development, adolescent gynecology, which is my area of interest. I do male health and psychiatry, certainly in the last number of years. I give lecture series to two hospitals, which are mostly virtual, and about 10 lectures a year cover most of the curriculum content. And I wanted to show you a couple of the projects that have grown out, been an outgrowth of my rotation. This was a recent uh, project that I worked on with my um, resident, uh, his name is Yash Shah. And you see, I always give my residents the first authorship. Um, and he, we created a questionnaire about social media and asking, it's actually ongoing now, asking resident, asking my patients and asking a lot of patients in the hospital about um, their use of social media. Do they feel addicted? Are they learning about certain health topics? Do they turn to social media rather than the pediatrician or parent? Um, we've gotten about 150 um, questionnaires back and this was the original pilot study. And hopefully this is gonna be presented at a national meeting sometime soon. And then this was another project. I happened to have an amazing case of a pelvic uh, farm body. And one of my residents had done a case report about it. Um, it turned out it was likely from an abuse situation, unfortunately. And she did a whole case uh, review. And you could see there's, there were several of these cases. This was a number of years ago. But it was such a good case presentation and poster that I wanted to show it to you. So... I'm gonna end with a couple of quotes, um, all of which sort of spoke to me and I hope will speak to anybody who's in resident education. Uh, formal education will make you a living, self-education will make you a fortune. And uh, by Jim Rohn, and I, I feel like that's what I try and teach my residents. I want them to learn how to learn for themselves because really in medicine, the three years is just the beginning. As we all know, how much, how much have we learned post-residency and, I, I often say that medicine is a cruel mistress. And this, so this is why Anton Chekhov's quote spoke to me. Medicine is my lawful wife and literature my mistress. When I get tired of one, I spend the night with the other. And I thought that was such a wonderful quote. Um, and finally, the art of medicine. And this is really what I try and train residents in the art rather than only the practice of medicine consists in amusing the patient while nature cures the disease. It's an old quote, but I think still relevant today. So in sum, um, my goals of the rotation are clearly communicated on day one of the rotation. They meet with me either virtually or in person, and they know exactly you know, what they're getting into when they're working with me. Um, they do need structure. You can't make it all loosey-goosey. It's got to be a structured learning experience, but they need some open time too. And I try and give residents a half day a week off just so they can reflect and read and think about what they've done Um and my key is really letting them get to be the first contact with the patient. Don't have them just watch, have them really get in there and get that history. And sometimes they'll surprise us and get history that we didn't get. Um, and again, from a personal perspective, that one-on-one -on -one time with residents has resulted in meaningful friendships, collaborations. I have a lot of residents that are now in practice and still refer to me um, and call me from all across the globe. Uh, when I have questions. And it's really been uh, a wonderful ride and I hope to keep doing it. And I'll thank you so much for your attention and take any questions. Well, Dr. Bro Goldberg, thank you so much. You've really offered us um, an inspiring talk about how to be really thoughtful um, about how you structure the education and making sure that you pull in the different pieces and really motivate your residents to be thoughtful as well about how they work with adolescents. And I, I really, um, I really love that. And I really 
it really shows how you value not only the adolescents, but the residents that you're training. So thank you. We have a couple of great questions. Um, the first one is, um, to what extent do you think that training residents needs to be aimed at changing attitudes rather than increasing their knowledge base? That's a great question. I, I think the answer is both. Um, you know, there's just some basic factual knowledge that residents need, I think, to get through a PEDS residency program and pass boards. So I try and get that factual knowledge out there, um, particularly at least the boards in, in our country really focus a lot on uh, psychosocial health, psychosocial development, as well as physical development. There's a lot of endocrine on our board. So I do try and cover that. So there's factual stuff that has to get out there. Um, attitudes is something that ha can happen over time. And, and sometimes you can change people's attitudes and sometimes you can't, you know? And I try and be respectful of every where everybody's coming in from. And, you know, if somebody's coming in with a certain belief system or thoughts, I, I don't necessarily counter that, um, but I, I just try and help them be more open-minded. And, you know, I've had residents sometimes that, you know, have a very hard time. I do it on my practice because it's mostly adolescent gynecology is mostly females. And I've had even male or female residents who've sometimes had concerns about that or had a harder time, um, you know, sort of an assumption that if, a, for example, if a girl is complaining of dysmenorrhea that, uh, you know, she's very anxious and depressed. And I think it's a lot about that. And yeah, that could be true, but like dysmenorrhea is real and we have to treat that. And so that's just what it's, that's like a typical example of something that I might, I might hear just, you know, unfortunately just people not, just not having that experience to know. So I, I do my best, but I only have four weeks. So I'm not sure how much I do over uh, the long term, but I, I do my best to try to do both. Fantastic. We have about two minutes. I wanted to ask you, um, do you have any recommendations for our delegates today about how we can motivate learners of different ages and backgrounds to learn about adolescent health? Right. So that, that's that been a challenge for me because I, I have had that situation. I've had residents all different places. And I, I, I try and find out a little bit about their culture. And that's what part of what I've designed with the one-to-one -one time, some of it is just chatting, you know, and not necessarily teaching to really understand what their culture is about. You know, for example, the example I'll give you is substance abuse, because I have a lot of residents that grew up in other countries where they just were not aware about drugs and alcohol at all. And, you know, they, they maybe went to private schools or, you know, grew up in a, just a different environment where that just was not there. And to understand, you know, what's going on, you know, particularly in the United States, we were seeing, you know, quite a bit of substance use in, in our in our teens and young people, uh, particularly since, um, you know, marijuana has been legalized in several states, including the state I practice in in New Jersey. And that's, you know, created a whole new paradigm for how we counsel about, um, you know, use of alcohol and marijuana as, as legal substances, um, at least in people over 21. So, you know, just creating, um, just giving people that background and helping them to understand, you know, that how our culture may be so different from theirs. Um, that's, that, that's how I've gotten people a little bit more interested and motivated. Sometimes, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but um, I try and just meet people where they are, I think is the best way to put it. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your talk today. I think you've offered us a lot to think about and yeah. you've really done an incredible um, comprehensive talk about what you're doing so that we can all really understand it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I'll stop sharing now. I'd like to take this moment to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Marlena Marquez. She's coming to us from Colombia. Um, Dr. Marquez Villarreal is a doctor and educator based in Bogota. She is a specialist in human development and sexual education. Dr. Marlena, please, um, we're excited to hear your talk. Best regard. Best regard for all of you. I want to know if you are um, if, if you are listening to me. We can hear you. And if you go uh, ahead and share your screen, we'll be able to see it as well. Okay.
Perfect. And then if you'll put it into, ah, fantastic. Ah, okay. Okay. Best regard, best regard for all of you. Thanks for inviting me to participate in this important symposium. I am happy to share with all of you. My presentation will especially focus in high quality and friendly care for adolescents. I'm pleased to share two successful experiences in healthcare for adolescents and in training of professionals to guarantee friendly and quality care so that adolescents trust the health service. I want to thank to my two teams to construct the, those, this project uh, that was in two cities in my country, Barranquilla, that is in the city in the Caribbean coast, and the other was in the department of Casanare in the Answer Plains. The first step to create the programs was to invite adolescents users of the health system and schools to participate in this process. These are the activities in which adolescents participate with the professionals. Intergener intergenerational meetings to build trust, adolescents expose their opinions, feelings, fears, preferences, plans, desires, expectations, and topics of interest for them. Professionals must be friendly. Second, language exchange. Where dialogues to expose and compare the language used in the different generations and the ways of naming different situations. For example, the jargon in current use. Third, organization of the site for care and group activities. Ideas are presented to design and organize a pleasant, comfortable, and quiet place for attention and educational and recreational activities. In those photos, you can see mm, our activities. Uh, that I explained in the, um, in the um, slide that I presented before. In this photograph, you can see um, the waiting room and lunch designed by adolescents for group educational and, recreation, and recreational activities. Those uh, was designed for them with uh, the supervision uh, of professionals, uh, teachers, and parents. In these photos, you can see um, those spaces in the adolescents propose to organize meeting and care places. Then proposed that, for example, in the, in the photo uh, at, at try, you can see uh, in the photo um, that the desk is a, constituting a barrier and the other photo below, uh, you can see that the, the desk is uh, in a way that allows the adolescents feel closer to the professional. And at, uh, in the other photos, I tried, you can see that professionals uh, is uh, like no closer. And the adolescents ask that professionals share with them as if they were 
with a family or friends. These are the activities only with professionals. Self recognition. In this activity, professionals reflect on the experiences they had in their adolescence to remember that they were different from the adults who surround them. Cinema Forum. In Cinema Forum, we used films to carry out an analysis of problems uh, or situations experienced or suffered by adolescents that affect them in, in any way. Interactive workshop, training for the transmission of knowledge and issues related to sexual and reproductive health, mental health, self-care, coexistence, and conflict resolution. Review statistics and driving guides. Managing prevalent disease in adolescents. In these photos, I want to show uh, the activities that I have commented. Interview. Interview is the first and most important tool in healthcare for adolescents. Perhaps it represents the only and last opportunity to diagnose, to correct, to advise, to interpret, to help. It's important to see that Dr. Dulanto said about that. It is necessary to remain calm and not to show discomfort with the adolescent's attitude, like if the adolescent is talkative, silent, tearful, sensitive, angry, aggressive, skeptical, justified. We have to be prepared to manage in the better way those situations. This is qualities of the doctor or professionals who treats adolescents have uh, to observe self-esteem and security, personal maturity, authority with flexibility, sensitivity, moral, culture, and spiritual values, understanding of human sexuality, free of prejudice and double standards, sincere and fluid communication with young people, knowledge of social problems in any kind of community. When I say spiritual values, I don't mean necessary religion, all of we that attends adolescence must be able to favor personal appointment, facilitate consultation with and without parents, give explanation directly, have them understand their illness, involve the adolescent in maintenance and recovery of their health, help 
They are a lesson develop their autonomy. Always speak the truth and avoid giving erroneous information when we don't know something. This is the most important part. Please don't forget it. For both individual attention and group activities, we follow the model of the modified HEADS acronym from Los Angeles Adolescent Clinic, the Einstein. We include in this topic, in these modified models, these topics about home, education and unemployment, activities, dieting, drugs, sleep, security, sexuality, suicide. We have not to fear talk about suicide. Professionals should not be allies of adolescents, allies of parents, moralizing, emotionally immature. Then, what to avoid? We have to avoid focus exclusively on sexual behavior, to experience and morbid curiosity, to sanction or criticize erotic manifestations of adolescence, to find a teenager attractive and have a crisis over it, to reactivate your own adolescent sexual conflicts and dissatisfactions, excessive attachment with feelings or of jealousy, and find the sexual possibilities of adolescents, trying to impose or test your appreciations on their decisions. Then, finally, recommendations, being able to modify our attitudes toward adoles adolescents respond to adolescents with sensitivity and appropriateness in their attitudes and behaviors, taking into account their needs at the time of their development, sharing a space for the construction of the healthcare and more allowed adolescents to trust health professionals and be motivated to learn and form teams to promote health among their peers. Guarantee confidentiality and rights-based care. This is too important. Our care that we can bring for adolescents must be based in rights. We invite to you about Dr. Dulanto said. What did he said? Knowledge about characteristics of their development, their way of becoming ill, the therapeutic resource available is not enough. The most important is an ability to feel at easy, comfortable, interest and commitment, proper techniques, mature sensitivity, avoid your belief from directing advice and counseling, informed consent, confidentiality, consideration, privacy, and especially respect in all sense. 
Russell Gallagher, father of adolescent medicine, said, the fact of providing adolescents with a specific place is not a guarantee of this cooperation. What really counts is the way in which doctors are professionals at their service, talk to them and trust them. Hence the importance of acquiring good interview skills. Uh, it's um, one of the group of our adolescents in, in Jopal Casanare. Thank you for your time. I wish you a well. Thank you so much. This was really incredible in the way that you brought us to the details of things that I think we don't always talk about when we talk about attitudes and what we need to think about working with adolescents. And so thank you for, for being brave and bringing that all to us. We have an excellent question in the chat. Um, it says, it can be really valuable to get professionals to reflect on their own experience of adolescence. But is there a risk that this can also distort their own perspective of their experiences with the current generation of adolescents so that um, they're taking maybe their own experience rather than fully understanding the experience of our current generation of adolescents? Um, please, uh, Raisa, uh, could you uh, repeat the question? Sure, and I'm gonna put it in the chat as well. Um, it can be helpful if we ask somebody who's um, a doctor for adolescent health to reflect on their own experiences so that they can be more understanding of young people. But if they are reflecting on their own experiences, isn't there a risk that they won't understand the current experience of young people? Um, what uh, we proposed uh, in in the in our projects was that uh, professionals uh, reflect uh, with a mental uh, or personal reflect about uh, her or uh, her own uh, adolescence uh, in order that they remember. Uh, all the situations that they uh, they had that uh, were or or, um, or cause difficult situations for in order that they understand that the adolescents in 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 these generations is prob probably suffer some situations uh, similar to their suffered, or it is possible that young uh, teenagers uh, in this uh, moment suffer another different because it uh, are different times. It, the problem mm -hmm. is that some professionals, some doctors, I'm so, or some professionals, when when being adults, uh, they uh, they don't remember that they were adolescents, and, and they change it and don't understand uh, the new generations. For example. Uh, I I am seeing many many people that I talk about uh, crystal generation. We have not to to put um, those uh, stigmatis stigmatization uh, in, in the teenagers, uh, children, and young pe uh, and young people because they are different. But if we, if we are, if we reflect our uh, ourselves, we we are able 
to understand them. I absolutely agree with you. I think that it's it's the ability to take the value and judgment out of it and just appreciate that this is a stage that everybody goes through. And it's more of an understanding of the overall feeling of being an adolescent or young person rather than the actual experience um, that they're having now with you know, technology or, or different generational changes. Dr. Ra, thank you so much for this talk. I think it's really helped us to think beyond where we already were um, and has opened our eyes to where we where we can be. Thank you again. I really, really appreciate your time. I'm going to introduce our fourth speaker now. Um, our fourth speaker is Dr. Enrique Berner from Argentina. He's a specialist in pediatrics and adolescent health, and he's also the postgraduate director in the faculty medicine department at the Buenos Aires University. Doctor, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lisa. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. First of all, let me thank Professor Richard Churchill and Professor Mauricio Scarpello and the EIH for having invited us to take part in this important symposium, Innovate Update in Education Training in Adolescent Health 2023. It's an honor for us to be available to share with you our experience and learning throughout all this year. One of the things we would like to share with you is how students embark on a journey of intellectual transformation, shaping their idea of what they would like to do, while they are strangers, talent, value, and interest, while learning how to better, to better help adolescents. Thank you. Uh, let's start, please. As you can see, our topic is excellence training for physicians in comprehensive and integral adolescent care. Then you can see the faculty in charge. Alberto Simeoni, Associate Director, Evangelina Cueto, Academic Coordinator, Laura Lancilotti, Academic Coordinator, Ximena Soledad Varela, Pedagogical Advisor, Maria Celeste Banucci, Pedagogical advisor, and Ms. Ilani Tamara Hafid, academic secretary. The sponsors are the Buenos Aires National Academy, Academy of Medicine, Argentina, Confederation of Adolescent and Young of Iberoamerican, Italy and the Caribbean, the Spanish Society of Adolescent Medicine, Montevideo School of Medicine, Uruguay Society of Endocrinology and Metabolismo y Manuel Quintela Clinical Hospital Montevideo, Uruguay. Why an excellent training program? Globally, evidence is growing that education in adolescent medicine improves the clinical performance of healthcare practitioners. A paradox persists, however, health professional report high interest in developing skills to work better with adolescents, and yet their education needs remain unmet. You can see with this an innovative education process, virtual lesson that better reaches to Ibero-American students. Clinical focus for different medical specialties provides skill and ability to better met adolescent demand from an interdisciplinary, intersectorial approach with focus on right, provide knowledge on health management and public policies, and promote cognitive conflict and metacognition. Let's pass on to the course basic. The postgraduate course has a comprehensive view on adolescents within its development context. It is composite of four correlative modules with a virtual theoretical practical approach with synchronous and asynchronous lesson, including a specific unit topic with an interdisciplinary intersectoral approach making emphasis on right. Addresses to physicians 
with at least five year experience as clinical doctor, pediatrician, family and general doctor, gynecologist, and psychiatrist. The course content has a solid academic background prepared by highly experienced specialty, professional as well as international and national reference. The objectives of the postgraduate course are to gain a deeper knowledge and skill on adolescent acquired at the different level of medical training. To acquire a specific semiotic skill at adolescent interview and physical examination. To create diagnostic and therapeutic algorithm for the most frequent adolescent appointment topic. To get to know and reflect on healthcare management and public policy design from a theoretical perspective as well as good practice experience. Teaching process, asynchronous lectures, synchronous lectures, expert lectures. Asynchronous lectures. Every unit has a synchronous lecture, that is, lessons are recorded by teacher on Zoom and uploaded to the University of Buenos Aires teaching platform, Moodle. This included recorded lesson, mandatory reading, and recommended reading for the next synchronous lectures. Synchronous lectures. Teachers in charge of each unit and invited, invited lecture will take part of synchronous lecture. This lesson consists in group debate of clinical case that will later be analyzed by all the class. per lectures. There are, at the start or end of the postgraduate unit, expert and world referent on different areas of adolescent medicine, will strangers' knowledge through their lectures. Teaching objectives promote cognitive conflict, deepen learning through metacognition, provide conceptual and methodological framework for the comprehensive and integrated care of adolescents, contribute to improving professional clinical medical quality, classify professional profile with the knowledge on health management, course analytical development. The course is organized in four modules with thematic units that progressive touch upon different stage of adolescent knowledge and their clinical assistance. This is complemented with integrated activity, basic and relevant health issues and situations. Then we can see the unit of the four modules. Module one, adolescent in context, have 12 units. The first, adolescent in the course of life, life skill, environmental determinants, children and adolescent rights, clinical interview with adolescent and their family, physical exam, immunization, physical activity in adolescent, gynecology, contraception, sexuality, and pregnancy in adolescent. Second module critical reading of biomedical data research. Has four units. The first is health science scientific research, data indexing and recovery, biomedical data research and research methodology. The third module is reason for consultation and referral to specialists. The first unit is nutritional pathology, chronic condition, endocrinology, gynecology pathology, urology pathology, rheumatology, neurology, oncohematology, infectology, dermatology, substance use, 
psychopedagogy in adolescent, psychopathology in adolescent and suicide. And the last one, module four, health management, has four, th uh, three units. Unit one, knowledge management. Unit two, quality management. Unit three, strategic planning and public policies. This is Ibero-Latin American outlook, teacher and student. In this slide, you can see student distribution. For uh, 54 Argentines, one Mexico, one Ecuador, one Dominic Republic, and one Panama. And here, the teacher distribution. 45 Argentine, one Colombia, one Costa Rica, two Chile, three USA, one Spain, one Mexico, one Peru, 12 Uruguay, and one Venezuela. In this slide, you can see the name of the expert lectures. Here we have more expert lectures. This is the platform Moodle for the asynchronous lesson. To conclude, we show here how we evaluate this learning process. With the stretching knowledge, debate team first year paper in logbook, debate team, a space where a student can debate a specific topic with expert, deepening and strengthening knowledge, ability and skills. First year paper, this paper will include learning from the first academic year where each student, whether alone or as a group, will work on a paper making reference to list three out of the 12th unit of the first year and have that have an impact on their clinical practice. And the logbook as a postgraduate culmination paper. Students will prepare a logbook of the knowledge acquired during this trip. In this slide, we can see the end of the first academic year with some in-person and online students at the Argentine National Academy of Medicine. In this slide, we can see the excellence academic space in adolescence at the Medical Science School of the University Buenos Aires, Argentina. Two programs, pro postgraduate program and a master degree. I'm closing my presentation with some pictures of Argentina for you to enjoy. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this talk. It is incredible the work that you're doing across Latin and South America. We are really lucky, I think, to be able to hear from you about this incredible way of training. And I think it, it fits so nicely with the work that um, we've heard already in this symposium. So thank you. I put a question in the chat for you. Um, the question is, why do you consider that cognitive 
conflict in students and developing their metacognitive knowledge is innovative. La, el proceso de producción de conflicto cognitivo significa que los alumnos traen sus propios conocimientos, se produce el desequilibrio cognitivo y a partir de ahí, en el sincrono, sincrónico con los docentes, se trabaja los conceptos y luego se produce el equilibrio. Yeah. Uh, he, the doctor says that when, uh, during the, the lectures, the, the students, they bring their own background of knowledge um, with the debate and in the asynchronic uh, class, uh, something uh, new is, uh, is learned because of the knowledge that I already have. So that's bring a new knowledge. And um, yeah, that's, that's why. Uh, the, the next uh, to uh, metacognition. Metacognition is an experience the student have with uh, our uh, learning. O sea que ellos hacen su propia experiencia con lo que van aprendiendo y se hace un autoanálisis del proceso. The students with the metacognition do their own uh, reflection and analyze uh, the, new, uh, the new knowledge y el que van and the process of, of learning uh, in, this, uh, in this course. It's fantastic. I think... It, it really is this opportunity for our learners to challenge themselves and to be able to think differently in order to be able to treat their patients well. And we speak about this with adolescents and young people, but really um, it's important across the board, I think, when we provide good care. Thank you so much, Dr. Bernard. This was incredible. Thank you and so much. I think the program that you're doing is incredible and um, something that we can all learn from so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. In closing, I would like to thank all of our speakers, our panelists. I think we have heard um, from around the world today and really um, learned so much. Thank you all of the attendees, the delegates who were here today to participate in this symposium. Um, as you know, this is the last of our four sessions of our symposium. We have structured them so that we can be in different time zones um, and serve our educators across the world. If you were unable to join us for any of the others, or if you'd like to share any of these that you saw today, um, sessions one and two are on the IAAH YouTube channel, and the link will be in um, the program or in the chat, and it will come to you in the follow-up email from, the, from your registration today. Um, these two sessions will be posted in the next seven days. I think the opportunities for learning, the opportunities for doing even better training and different training and innovative training are so crucial when we think about the world's youth population, which is just growing and growing and demanding, very appropriately demanding um, better care and excellent care. Um, I would like to encourage you to fill out the feedback form. It's not just for us to know if you like this or not, but also really so that we can know what you would like to see in the future. Um, we are interested in hosting more of these symposiums or webinars, but we're also interested in meeting the need um, around adolescent health education of health professionals. And so we'd like to make sure that we hear from you about what that need is in your region and your area. I would also like to um, make sure that you know about our website. It's IAAH.org. And there we have um, our 
recently developed policy on educating healthcare professionals, which we hope um, is really valuable and helpful around the world for increasing the field um, and getting the support that you need. We would definitely like to see you again in our future sessions. Thank you all so much for being here. You've been a wonderful audience and you've had good questions and I really appreciate it. So at, um, at this point, I would like to say, I wish you a good day and we hope to see you soon. Thank you again. Namaste, Namaste from you. India. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you Bye. so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. All the best.